Hi and welcome back to the second part of our roundabout tour of South Africa here at Noble Green. Um, last week we crossed, crossed over from the Cape South Coast into the Klein Karoo. As a warmer climate area, um, if you think of the Dura in Portugal and River, Riverland or Rutherglen in Australia, they tend to be naturally gravitating towards fortified wine production. Heading west from the Klein Karoo, we have the Breed River Valley area. Uh, now this has lots of different sort of parcels within it and the area we want to look at today is Robertson. Um, there's lots of different soil types here, mainly alluvial soil, uh, but importantly there's some really small outcrops of limestone, which is unusual in South Africa with its ancient soils to have these limestone areas. Uh, but it's really great soil, as you may remember from talking about sparkling wine previously, for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. They really like the drainage and the water storing capabilities of limestone. Um, and also in a warmer climate, it helps moderate the effects of the climate and temperature on the vine. Now, the first one we're going to look at today from Robertson is the Grainbeck Sparkling. Uh, the winery was started back in 1983 by the very highly respected Grainbeck, um, who started off in industry but bought the estate um, at, the really, at the very beginning of, of proper modern wine production in South Africa. Um, and from very early on, they focused on sparkling wine, and now they're exclusively sparkling wine. The winemaker here is Peter Ferreira, or Peter Bubbles Ferreira, as he's known. Um, and he's also head of the MCC Association. Um, now, the MCC is not the Maryland Cricket Club. It stands for Methode Cap Classique, and that is the name for that South Africa has given to sparkling wine production. They don't have quite as strict rules as champagne um, production in South Africa. Um, to, be, to be fair, no one does. Um, champagne is quite strictly controlled. Um, there's a minimum of 12 months that the wine needs to spend on its lees, um, but you can use any great variety you want. Um, in South Africa they tend to focus on the traditional varieties of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. You don't see much Pinot Meunier, just historically it's not that significant in South Africa. Um, I have had a sparkling wine made from Pinotage and I think the less said about that the better frankly. Um, this is a very traditional example, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir blended together to make a sparkling wine. Um, just a quick refresher here on the sparkling wine production method, the traditional method or champagne method. Um, the base wine or wines are vinified to about 11%. Um, they, are then, they then go through the second fermentation under a crown cap um, with a little bit of sugar and yeast added, uh, which produces a little bit more alcohol to about 12.5% and a lot more CO2, which is trapped in the wine. Um, the wine is then riddled upside down to help expel the little bit of yeast in the top, topped up and then bottled as normal after it's left, as I said, for its minimum of 12 months on its lees. Uh, we'll be going into sparkling wine production in much more detail later on, but that's just a quick recap. The base wines from this particular wine come from about 40 different parcels, most of them in Robertson, but they also get um, wines from all over, even as far as Stellenbosch. Now the reason they blend all these different wines together is for a non-vintage style is they want consistency year after year, so they use some reserve wines that are kept from particularly good vintages, and they blend them all together in different proportions in different years so that they get a consistent style year in, year out. Another thing they do here is they pick quite early. Robertson's quite a warm area, much warmer than Champagne, and as you would expect, the grapes ripen very quickly, so they pick early to avoid over-ripeness because you want to retain that freshness. The other thing they do is they avoid the malolactic fermentation. Now this is another little trick that winemakers use. It can make a wine slightly softer and more buttery. What it basically does is it turns the malic acid, which is the tart acid that you get in a really green apple, and it turns it into lactic acid, which is the acid you'd find in milk, which is much softer and buttery. Um, they avoid that here, so again, it keeps the freshness. Some winemakers do allow it a little bit. In Champagne, it is generally done, but some producers avoid it in order to retain the freshness or the house style. Um, another quick word to say here yeah, about opening a bottle of fizz, any bottle of fizz, is to keep your thumb over it at all times because they tend not to but they can explode and the best and most controlled way to do it is to hold the cork and twist the bottle it just gives you a bit more control over the opening of it Now you've got lovely, soft, delicate bubbles in this, and what that says to me is that it's had quite a bit more 
bottle maturation and the minimum required um, to get those little fine bubbles. It's also been stored in relatively cool conditions. If you think of the champagne cellars, not to relate everything to France, but the champagne cellars are about 11 degrees and quite damp, and that consistently cool temperature helps the wine mature. Now this, as well as the citrus fruit you'd expect to find from a nice, light, white, ostensibly white wine, there's also a little bit of red fruit in there as well from the Pinot Noir. Now there's no colour, but if you tasted this blind, you could be mistaken in thinking that it's a rosé, which it isn't. The same thing is true if you ever taste the base wines in sparkling wine, like a still white Pinot Noir that's been pressed without any skin contact. It can taste like a rosé or a red wine. So you've got that little bit of red currant and rose hip coming through as well. Lovely sort of br biscuity, briochey element from the Lee's ageing that it's had. That lovely sort of buttery flavour coming through as well. Really, really lovely crisp acidity. Considering it's so warm in Robertson, that they've managed to retain that as a real testament to the winemaker's ability. This is a really beautiful, well-balanced wine. I've actually shown this blind against champagnes in tasting, and people often prefer this to much more expensive champagnes or other sparkling wines. This is a really nice aperitif for sparkling wine. It would work really well with pâté or dressed crab, smoked salmon, all those sort of things. It would be really lovely with. Heading south from Robertson, we come to Stellenbosch, and this is the name that everyone knows in terms of South African wine. It really is the heartland of production. It's where all of the most famous producers are based, uh, Vogelagen, Birkenhurst, Cliff, Meerlust, Telema, to name just but a few. Um, the, there's a huge range of different wines made around the area and several different sub-regions. Uh, it's all grouped around the charming little town of Stellenbosch, which is a lovely university town, really pretty, and it's naturally enough, there's a lot of wine tourism in the area as well, um, which, which is it's a fantastic area to visit and look around. Um, and the vineyards usually have really nice restaurants attached to them as well. This area is also home to a lot of those gorgeous Cape Dutch gabled farmhouses that you see on all the sort of South African wine tourist information pages. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous. Bergelagen, I think, has one. Most, most of the estates have one attached to them. And usually, again, a nice restaurant to visit too. Um, the Chenin Blanc along with saint -Sau, were traditionally planted here. Um, again, as I mentioned before, they're sort of workhorse grapes, high yielding, can be a bit bland if they're not sort of planted and managed properly. Um, but they're fallen out of favour with the emergence of the Bordeaux varieties and the Burgundy varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Merlot, and a bit of Syrah as well. There is, however, an emergence of winemakers who are seeking out some of the old plantings of Chenin Blanc and saint -Sau. They're, they're, These old vines are really low yielding, but they yield some highly flavourful and concentrated fruit. So we're seeing a bit of both worlds here, sort of going back to the old and the emergence of the new in terms of what they're making in this area. Um, the Chenin Blanc actually still, there's more Chenin Blanc in South Africa than the whole of the Loire Valley, where it's originally from, so it's by no means past its best in terms of South African winemaking. Stellenbosch is also home, as I mentioned before, to uh, Stellenbosch University and its viticulture department is where they initially started getting the vines replanted after the phylloxera devastated the area. It's also where Pinotage was created in South Africa, they have quite a big problem with virus in their vine stock. Um, there's things like leaf curl virus and lots of other things that are causing real problems for them. There's lots of new plantings coming in, but the problem is they have such strict um, biological controls, which is a good thing, but it means it's very hard to get new plantings and new vines in to replace the old stock that needs to be grubbed up and replaced. Um, the problem's getting better, but it's, there's no denying that it is something they're still having to tackle, and it's a bit of a hangover from the pre-apartheid cooperative days. As I mentioned before, there's lots of sub-regions that are being uh, delineated within Stellenbosch itself. Um, the Simmonsburg Mountain was one of the first, and it's got that sort of lovely sort of mountain granitic schist that is so perfect for growing the vines on. The second wine we're going to look at today is from Stellenrust. It's a barrel-fermented Chenin Blanc from relatively old vines, 50-plus years old. I'll give that a taste next. Now, as I mentioned before, old vines tend to give you a lot more concentration in the fruit, and there's no point barrel fermenting um, and barrel aging a wine that doesn't have that concentration to start with. It just won't work. You need 
the, the, the treatment of the wine after it's been vinified needs to sort of match the structure of the wine to begin with. Now this has got a lovely butterscotch aroma, that's the first thing that leaps out at you, that Shannon honeyed character, but the oak is definitely to the fore in this wine. The same flavours coming through on the palate, a little bit of butterscotch, a little bit of brioche. Another thing you might notice is it's a little bit drying, and that's from tannins. Now these aren't from the grape, the tannins here are actually wood tannins from the oak, because it's, it's had such intensive oak ageing that it's actually some of it's gone into the wine so you get that lovely granular texture i think it works really well now this is a really nice wine um, i would actually move beyond the usual recommendations of fish with this and say this is a, really a cheese wine it could be either something like comte uh, camembert or even a vacheran a really strong smelly french cheese um, i would actually like to see this wine another five or ten years time i think the oak will have diminished a little bit and the honeyed character of the chenin blanc will actually develop much more and I think it'll be more harmonious and balanced with a bit more bottle age but it's fantastic now a really good food wine. Uh, to the northeast of Stellenbosch is the large Pal region now this is again all about large-scale production there's a few small wineries there producing some interesting wines but really the whole area is overshadowed by the much smaller Franschuk uh, which was settled by French Huguenots. Um, Franschuk actually means French corner and it, it's reflected in everything from the architecture to the whole style of the place um, some of the best restaurants in the whole of South Africa are found in this little town. Uh, it's absurdly pretty, a really lovely destination, um, but it's also got the most fantastic vineyards all the way around the town, just about within walking distance. But they do actually have a little wine train or trains that go around, which seems like a good idea at the time until you've been tasting wines all afternoon and then you realise that it is a little bit jerky and juddery, um, not ideal after a whole day's tasting. Considering its size, uh, many of the producers in Franschuk are well known to us in the UK. There's Boschendal, Nederberg, Fairview, uh, Bellingham, to name but a few. Um, naturally enough, given the French heritage, Cabernet and Shiraz do particularly well here. Um, but what we've got here is the Chamonix Greywacky Pinotage. Uh, so we're finally coming to South Africa's signature grape for our final wine and our little tour of the area. As we briefly mentioned last time, uh, Pinotage is a crossing of Pinot Noir and Sanso, um, and I think what they were trying to achieve with this is to get some of the elegance and perfume of Pinot Noir, uh, which on its own can be a bit unreliable, with the sort of reliability and the heavy cropping of Sanso. But I don't think this is really like either of its parents. It's very much its own thing, and I think that is a good thing. Handled badly, Pinotage can produce some really unpleasant flavours. Uh, traditionally, things like pear drops, acetone, nail varnish, it, it can handle badly and make really bad wine very easily. I think when it's handled properly and the yields are kept down and it's vinified sensitively, uh, particularly with a little bit of oak, it can produce a really fantastic wine. Now this has a lovely perfume. There's none of those sort of acetone-y, sort of horrible off flavours. You've got a really lovely perfume, a little bit actually Pinot Noir in there as well I think, but a lot richer than a Pinot Noir. Really lovely broad fruit on the palate. There's a bramble there, black currant, a really lovely savoury character as well. This is not jammy or over extracted. It's 14% alcohol which is relatively high for something that has this lightness of touch but it's got a lovely balance of fruit, acidity and body. Um, this is a really nice wine. One of the things I would say about Pinotage is it's never going to be my favourite grape, but what I love about this wine in particular is that it is a wine of its place. Every bit as much as a Chablis could only be from Chablis, or you know, a Napa Cabernet could only be from, what, from where it is. This, this is a wine that speaks of its place, and I think that's a really important thing in the modern wine world, where everyone's trying to make wines that sort of fit a particular profile or a slot on a supermarket or a wine merchant shelf. This, I think, would be fantastic with a bit of springbok on the braai. And we look forward to seeing you next time when we sail across the ocean to South America. So, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.